welcome or welcome back to Pretty Planet. My name is Tara for those of you that are new and for those of you that are returning I do thank you guys so much for coming back to hang out with me. We are reviewing session four of When You Pray. This is a Bible study that I have been covering over here on my channel. There are seven sessions to this Bible study and today session four is covered by Jen Wilkin. You guys I have had the hardest time trying to bring this review to you guys. I have recorded it once and I lost the footage. I know, I know. <laughs> so I had to regroup, give myself some time and record this all over again. So this is my second recording. I hope it all goes well. I hope I can, you know, cover everything that's meant to be covered in this session. I do pray that you all are doing well. I'm doing good. Just giving this my second go round at um, covering this session four for this Bible study review. So let's get started, you guys. Session four is titled, Your Works Are Wondrous. I do have some notes and I'm going to let you guys know I took very little notes because in session four, it frequently refers us back to scriptures. So what I'm going to do here is point out some scriptures. You guys may remember from the other reviews, it's covered in five days. So we go from day one to day five, but I noticed in session four, there is an abundance of scripture and that's not a problem. We'll just review most of them, the ones that um, goes along with the point that they're trying to um, hone in on, okay? So what I wanna start off with, I have my iPad here for um, the scriptures and we're gonna use the Bible app. And I do have my notes here, so I'm gonna just open it up to there. I have very little notes, you guys, like I said, but it's okay. We're really gonna follow along what's in the book for this session. It's kinda unlike the other sessions that I've covered, but we're gonna give it our best shot, right? So session four, your works are wondrous covered by Jen Wilkin. And this session focuses on the Bible passage from Psalms 139. We all know that David is the writer of Psalms. And then um, the prayer type that we're focusing on is prayers of adoration. And it says, when our prayers begin with adoring God, we make different requests than what we otherwise might. I do want to point out that Adore means to worship, revere, and honor. So adoration and petition means declaring who God is and responding to that declaration with a specific request of what God must do. With that being said, I think it's a good time for us to cover the attributes of God because one might ask, why would we begin our prayers with adoration and praise? And why is that so important? It is my um, belief and my understanding that when we know who God is, it's easier for us to go into prayer adoring him for just that, exactly who he is. So let's read the attributes of God. It is covered in um, Psalms 139 again, and one of God's attributes is that he is eternal, which means God is not limited by time. He exists outside of time. God is holy. It says God is perfect, pure, and without sin. He's infinite, which means God has no limits to his power or on his power. And he is incomprehensible, which means God is beyond our understanding. We can comprehend him in part, but not in a whole. And he is also omnipresent, which means God is fully present everywhere. He's omniscient, which means God knows everything, past, present, and future, all potential and real outcomes, all things micro and macro, all things small, all things large. 
God is also self-existent, which means God depends on nothing and no one to give him life or existence. So these are important attributes of God that we need to consider when we are praying to God, the attributes of God, eternal, holy, infinite, incomprehensible, omnipresent, omniscient, and self-existent. So we'll go back to day one. Day one covers God knows, and it says, before you begin today's study, pray Psalms 119 and 34, which reads, help me understand your instruction, and I will obey it and follow it with all my heart. Amen. We're going to just skip around to some key factors about what God knows. So if I go to Psalm 119, 39, 1 through 4, we will cover all these things that God knows about us. So 139, 1 through 4, it says, O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I am going to say even before I say it. And that is Psalm 139, 1 through 4. In this scripture here, these verses that I just read, God knows our thoughts. He knows our daily habits. He knows our words. He knows our location. Amen for that. And then it says, theologians refer to God's complete and total knowledge as his omniscience. He holds perfect knowledge of past, present, and future. And we just read those attributes of God. And what I did want to point out is they have some notes here by an author, A.W. Tozer. And this author wrote, God knows instantly and effortlessly all matter and all matters all mind and every mind, all spirit and all spirits, all being and every being, all creaturehood and all creatures, every plurality and all pluralities, all law and every law, all relations, all causes, all thoughts, all mysteries, all enigmas, all feelings, all desires, every unuttered secret, all thrones and dominions, all personalities, all things visible and invisible in heaven and in earth, motion, space, time, life, death, good, evil, heaven, and hell. God knows all, you guys. There is nothing that he doesn't know. There's nothing that we can hide from him. Absolutely nothing. These are some scriptures that describes God omniscience. And we'll just go through maybe, um, we'll cover Job 37 and 16. And then I'll go to Psalm 44 and 20 through 21, just because there's a lot of scriptures and I don't want to focus on all of them. I'll just pick a couple from each day. So the first one is Job 37 and 16. So let's go there. And it says, do you know how the clouds are balanced? Those wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge. So that is Job 37 and 16. And then Psalm 44, 20 through 21. It says, if we had forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a foreign God, would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of our heart. Amen. We can't hide anything from God, you guys. I actually want to read Psalm 147 and 5 as well. It says, great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. Amen. You guys, this session was so imperative. And I love that the focus is on adoration and prayer. So as we move on, I want to point out the things that I did highlight. It says here from that author, Tozer. These are Tozer's words to consider when we're talking about God's eternality. He wrote, because God lives in an everlasting now, he has no past and no future. When time words occur in scripture, they refer to our time, not his. 
And then here it says, God has already lived all our tomorrows as he has lived all our yesterdays. That's also by Tozer. And then there's scriptures that they also pointed out referring to God's eternality, which is Psalm 90 and 2. So we'll go there. And it reads, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you have formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Amen. Let's go to Psalm 102 and 12. And that scripture reads, But you, O Lord, shall endure forever, and the remembrance of your name to all generations. Amen. Let's go for Isaiah 41 and 4. Oops. It reads, Who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he. Amen. You guys, I love that we're covering the attributes of God, his eternality. A lot of times, um, like it said, that God is incomprehensible. It reminds me of a phrase that I often tell people who are new believers or even non-believers um, when you're trying to express who God is and how God exists. I often say, and this is my perspective and how I understood things um, as I started my walk with the Lord, is God cannot be explained. He has to be experienced. So as much as we can cover in a Bible study or as much as we can cover um, pointing out different scriptures, still sometimes, you guys, people don't understand and that's what it means when it says God is incomprehensible. God is beyond our understanding. We can comprehend him in part, but not in a whole. So once we experience God, then the doubt, it kind of departs from you. I know it did for me. When I start to experience in God in my life, the doubt was like removed because I also can say now that I know too much about him to doubt him right? I know many of you have probably heard that phrase as well, but it's absolutely true. Once you know about God and you know who God is and you've experienced the move of God in your life and you've seen God work miracle signs and wonders, then you know too much about him to doubt him. So that's also an important factor of why we need to know his attributes, right? So if we go on, we can look up verses that tells about where God is. And we'll go to 1 Kings 8 and 28. Amen. I don't want to be preaching, you guys, but I'm sorry. It's 1 Kings 8 and 27. Um, I just had to let that be known because a lot of times um, I am approached by non-believers and, you know, people who just want to know what I know. And I often tell people, I don't know it all. I am a forever student of the word, um, but I can tell you what I do know. And I do know the Lord and I do know to point you back to his word. So 1 Kings 8 and 27 reads, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. Amen. And then Jeremiah 23, 23 through 24. And it reads, I am a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off. Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not feel heaven and earth, says the Lord? Absolutely. This again, you guys, is pointing to there is nowhere we can go where God doesn't see us, right? He is everywhere. He's omnipresent. There's nowhere we can go where he doesn't see us. Let's go for Isaiah 66 and 1, and then we'll move on. 
It says, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? Amen. Let's go on, you guys. It also points out the hand that holds you wherever you go. So let's look at these scriptures that talks about God's right hand because that is the hand that holds us wherever we go. So let's go to Exodus. And that is 15 and 6. And it reads, Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. Amen. Let's go back to Psalms 89 and 13. And it reads, you have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand and high is your right hand. Amen. Since we're in Psalms, we'll look at 98 and 1. And it reads, oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. Amen. Amen, you guys. You see how I say every section points us back to scripture, and that's okay. This is the best way for us to learn. And then this is what, again, what we call God being everywhere that is omnipresent. So we'll go on to day three, which covers God does. And it says, David praises God as the uncreated creator the one who gives life, but who receives it from no one. God is self-existent. God is our origin, and he is the origin of all things. So Tozer, that author that I mentioned before, this is his words. It says, origin is a word that can apply only to things created. When we think of anything that has origin, we are not thinking of God. God is self-existent. While all created things necessarily originated somewhere at some time, aside from God, nothing is self-caused. And then this points out scriptures that refer to the creative work of God. And so we'll go there. Genesis 1 and 1, we all might know it. And for those of you that don't, it's okay. I'm going to read it right here for you. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is Genesis 1 and 1. This is the very beginning of the Bible. Let's go to John 1, 1 through 4. And it reads, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Amen. That is a very important scripture, you guys. Hold tight to John 1, 1 through 4. Let's go to 2 Corinthians Five and 17. And it reads, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. This is also a very important passage that um, I hold near and dear to my heart. And then this here says, if God made everything, to whom does everything belong? Let's go to Psalm 24 and 1 because we know he made everything. And so this scripture is going to tell us the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Amen. So that means everything belongs to the creator, which is God. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Everything, everything, you guys. So here it takes us to scriptures that points out limits and God. And we'll go there to Job 11, 7 through 9. Job 11, 7 through 9. Okay, I'm just going to highlight it to keep me on track here. 
It says, can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. That is again talking about limits in God. Let's go to Psalm 119, 96. Okay. And it reads, I have seen the consummation of all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad exceedingly broad, very, very big, very, very broad, you guys. Let's go to Psalm 147 and 5 since we're here. And it reads, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. His understanding is infinite. And where's my pen? It says, because God is limitless, he is unable to be fully comprehended by a limited human mind. Again, God can't be explained. He has to be experienced. Again, that's kind of my motto and, you know, something that I live by. God can't be explained. He has to be experienced. Because God is limitless, he is unable to be fully comprehended by a limited human mind. The Bible reveals to us all that is necessary for life and godliness with regard to the knowledge of God, but the number of things that are true about him is infinite. C.H. Spurgeon shows, he's another author, you guys, shows us how the recognition of an incomprehensible God should impact us. And I'm just going to read this paragraph here from C.S. Spurgeon. It says, there's something exceedingly improving to the mind in a contemplation of the divinity. It is a subject so vast that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. Other subjects we can compass and grapple with, in them we feel a kind of self-contentment and go on our way with the thought. Behold, I am wise. But when we come to this master science, finding that our plumb line cannot sound its depth and that our eagle eye cannot see its height, we turn away with the thought, I am but of yesterday and know nothing. Absolutely. The number of things that is true about God is infinite. You guys, that is so very important. Let's look at some scriptures that talks about the ability to understand God, which will go to Psalm 145 and 3. It says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. His greatness is unsearchable. Amen. Let's go to Psalm 147 and 5. I think we just read that one. We did. Let's go to Romans 11, 33 through 35. I, I did pass it. <laughs> okay. Romans 11 33 through 35 and it reads oh the depth of the riches both of wisdom and knowledge of god how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out for who has known the mind of the lord or who has become his counselor or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him amen that is romans eleven thirty three through 35 you guys, again, I wrote it here. I'm not going to keep saying it, but I'm just going to move this out the way for now because I keep bumping into it. But I did right here. God cannot be explained. He has to be experienced. These things just keep pointing me back to that. In day four, it covered God is holy. And it says, David now turns from adoration to petition. How are we to learn from David's cries of hatred and calls for bloodshed? We're going to compare and contrast the Psalms um, 139, 19 through 22. They have it written here in the CSB version, which is Christian Standard Bible. And then here in the ESV, which is English Standard Version. And 
The CSB says, God, if only you would kill the wicked, you bloodthirsty men, stay away from me. Who invoke you deceitfully? Your enemies swear by you falsely. And then the ESV version says, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. For me, this is more understandable, the ESV version, you guys. But again, I do point out, um, I believe more so on my Faith Field Friday videos, um, that I do compare different versions of scripture just so I can find the version that I can best understand. Here it contrasts Psalms 139, 21 through 22. And it says, Lord, don't I hate those who hate you and detest those who rebel against you? I hate them with extreme hatred. I consider them my enemies. And then the ESV version says, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. And so um, here it says, when David wrote Psalm 139, he was facing flesh and blood enemies who wanted to destroy him. But what about us? Look up Ephesians 6, 11 through 12 and fill in the blanks. And then I did that and I filled in the blanks here, which says, for our fight is not against flesh and blood. Amen. And then if we read on, it goes on to tell us the different things that impacts our fight. So then as we move on, it says here, in light of this spiritual truth, what should we hate with complete hatred? What should we ask God to put to death? So let's look at these three scriptures here, Romans 8 and 13. I hope I'm not boring you guys with scripture. I think it's imperative that they pointed out different things because when we're talking about God and we're talking about his attributes and we're educating people on who God is, we always want to refer back to the word because the word is everlasting. It's never going to fail us. It's never going to lead us in a wrong direction when we point people back to the word. So Romans 8 and 13 reads, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. Amen. Let's go to Galatians 5 and 24. And it reads, And those who are with Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Amen. Let's go to Colossians 3, 5 through 6. And it reads, therefore, put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Amen. Okay. And when we talk about God being holy, it reminded me, I wrote here 1 Peter 1 and 16, where it says, Be holy, for I am holy. And day five covered God is to be adored, right? We talked about um, this whole session being about adoration and praise. And God is to be adored. Adored, again, means you guys to worship, revere, and honor. And I do want to point out a closing question here. It says, how does meditating on God's holiness, omniscience, eternality, omnipresence, self-existence, limitlessness, and incomprehensibility help us to walk in the everlasting way? How does it help us to turn from the wide path of folly and walk the narrow path of holiness? Amen. That is a good question, you guys, to ponder on. I know I have. Um, sometimes I go through and I answer these questions here in my notes. Um, I know I didn't cover much of what's in my notes, but a lot of these things um, I also covered in the book, right? So, again, we want to always, always, always reverence God 
for who he is. We know God is eternal. We know he's holy. We know he's infinite. We know he's incomprehensible. We know he's omnipresent. He is everywhere. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's self-existent, which means he already existed. Nothing or no one created him. And so when we know these attributes, again, you guys, it helps us with prayer of adoration and petition. So that is everything I believe that I have um, for session four, which again was titled Your Works Are Wondrous by Jen Wilkin. Let me know, you guys, what you think of this Bible study review. If um, you were able to follow along with the scriptures, if it was helpful, I did not want to just share my notes and everything I got out of this because I thought it was very important to cover scripture. So I pray again that you all would join me for session five. There is seven sessions. We're almost done, you guys. I'm going to try to make it not so far and few in between. I really wanted to do this every week, but then I I started a new job. I lost the video footage, so I had to do this all over. But I do thank you guys for being here. Um, yeah, thank you so much for hanging out with me for this Bible study. Let me know what you think, if this is helpful. And Lord willing, I will see you in my next video. Remember to keep praying, keep planning, and make it pretty.